Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verses 27 through 34. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Good morning, church, and welcome to those joining online. Hello to you, too, as we are still in a sermon series. Woo! Woo! So excited about that. If you haven't been with us, oh, I thought you were, like, woohooing. You were just fanning yourself. I see. Okay. It was like, it was, oh, okay. All right. Okay. I saw, I saw a bunch of ruckus momentum over there, and I thought she was with me, but not so much. So uh, we are in a sermon series, and we're so excited about that because we have been uh, looking in this uh, season of Lent where we are just looking at ourselves once again and thinking about how in the world we can become more holy and more like God and once again put to death those things in our life that do not give him glory. We've been looking at stories of the Bible and the sermon series is called this, Family Pictures Not Posted on Social Media. And the whole idea of this sermon series is that, uh, you know, a lot of times when you're on social media, you don't really get the bad pictures, do you, of your family or your kids or your car or yourself or any of your bad moments. You always put your best foot forward. But it's really interesting that the Bible doesn't do that. It really shares the life of uh, all the people that are in it and both those good moments where they are the big heroes of the story and even those really tragic moments where they have big, huge character flaws and really everything in between. And so we've been looking at some of those stories that when we look at the, the people of faith, the the people that God had chosen to work through and come to to bring us Jesus Christ, those people of faith oftentimes did things you go, huh, I don't know how I feel about that as being someone as part of the family, but just like any family, we know that as being part of the family, there are people that sometimes don't do maybe what we think they should do. And the story, of course, continues on. Well, we've looked at a couple people already. We looked at Abraham and Sarah, and we looked at Isaac and Rebekah, and today we're looking at Jacob and Esau. Dun, dun, dun. Now I'll let you know if you've been with us and, and tracking these last few weeks, uh, this is not a story where somebody you know, tells their wife, hey, you're going to pretend to be my sister and go to a land. Because we've seen that that happened over and over these last couple weeks with some of the family, uh, in the family tree, if you will. This is a story that breaks that mold and goes a different way. And it is actually the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, which we're really concerned about here today. Well, I wish I could tell you this morning that Jacob was truly a man of honor, but I would not be true. In fact, let us pray here today. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, to understand this story, you have to understand twins, which I have quite a bit of knowledge in at this point in my life, but you have to understand twins, and these twins were born right at the same time, and of course, as they came out, they were, before they even came out, that is, they were fighting in their mother's womb. In fact, Rebecca inquired of the Lord, because she felt all this tossing and turning inside her, and she inquired of the Lord, and the Lord had told her before the story, the Lord had said this to her, she, it said, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples with, with whom will you will be separated one people will be stronger than the other. And here's the key part of it. The story that God says to her is this. The older will serve the younger. Now, in ancient times, of course, that's flipped upside down. The older brother, if you will, was the master of the, the, the parents, you know, 
inheritance and all these different things. And so basically the younger was always supposed to be serving the older, but God says to Rebecca, this is not going to be the case with your children, but two mighty nations will arise. And so in fact, it talks about this story, how they, she gives birth. And in fact, when they give birth, the first one that's born is Esau. And he comes out, it says red and hairy. You got to be described as something, I guess might as well be red and hairy, right? So he comes out red and hairy, big and strong and all that stuff. And then, of course, Jacob is born. And when Jacob is born, he comes out grabbing the heel of his brother, kind of like, no, I must go first. I'm yanking you back kind of vision of like just pulling him back and kind of get out first to be that first son to crave it, if you will, that even as an infant was was jostling for it and trying to get it. Now, what's interesting there is Jacob's name means exactly that. He who grasps the heel. That's what it literally means. But it has a secondary meaning, a figurative meaning, that actually is much more helpful. It means he who deceives. In fact, Jacob's whole name, Jacob of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob is named he who deceives. And in fact, this story comes out of today, where Jacob really has no right to the birthright. It's Esau's fair and square. And this story takes place where Esau is out and he's been hunting. He's a skilled hunter and he goes out. He must have not caught anything because he comes back, as the scripture says, famished. Now, we've got to pause here to understand this because it's really key to the story. When you and I think of famished, at least when I do, when I think of famished, there's a, there's a picture that comes to mind. And that picture that first comes to mind for me is basically World War II Nazi Holocaust concentration camps, right? Where people were literally starving to death. And you think of that image. That's not the image that this, this Hebrew word wants you to visualize. In fact, when it's used other places in the Old Testament, it's like this. It's when some, an army's chasing an army, and they stop, and it talks about how they're, they're exhausted and weary. That's kind of the visual image of what it is. And so when Jacob comes back, he's not famished in the sense that he's literally about to die. He's famished in the sense as, you know, as if you had just played a big football game or a sporting event that was very taxing on you, or ran a marathon, and you get back, and you're just exhausted. But you're not really near technically death, right? So you got to understand that concept when it says that he was famished. Really, we should almost translate it, he was really, really hungry, right? He had, he had the Snickers bar hunger, where he was just ready to chew people's heads off, and he just needed to eat something to feel right, right? And so he comes in, as the story says that we read, and when he comes in, he sees Jacob there. And Jacob's cooking up a meal and making it all nice and toasty. And he's making this lentil soup. Mmm, yummy, yummy lentil soup. No one, no one said yummy, yummy lentil soup. I gotcha. I feel you, people, right? You're not lentil people. I got it. But they were. Jacob was. He was cooking his lentil soup, making his thing. And all of a sudden, Esau comes back and basically says these words. When he says, comes in, he says, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. I am famished really hungry, right? And Jacob turns to him and does the good brother thing and says, oh, sure, brother, I love you so much, right? Here's some stew. Get your strength back. Let me get you some water and pat you on the back, right? No, no, no. That's not at all what happens with these twin brothers that kind of jostle with each other. Jacob tells to, replies to him, sell me your birthright. In other words, hey, brother of mine who's really hungry, I made this soup Give me your birthright. In other words, I'm going to be like the first son that was born, and you're not. Give that to me, and I'll give you some of the soup. And as the scripture says, Esau says these words, and you have to understand these are hyperbole. Look, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, no, 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 no. Swear it to me. Swear it to me first. And so... Esau swore to him the oath, selling his brothers, uh, selling the birthright to Jacob. And so Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank and got up and left. And as the scripture says here that Esau despised his birthright. I don't know about you, but when I come to this story, there's a few things that occur to me. First of all, what is your brother doing, right? <laughs> like, you as a brother are supposed to love on your brother and you're trying to steal his birthright. That gives you kind of a, a feeling for the, the relationship of these two brothers. But they were going at it all the different time, jostling for who would be better, who would be the best, who was going to have the birthright, who was going to have the property, who was really truly the first son, and all these different things. And yet, Jacob was willing 
to basically, in that sense, almost just take advantage of his brother at a time where his brother just wasn't thinking clearly and take his own birthright from him. The birthright was a very special thing. It was something that was kind of considered the blessing of the Lord descending upon that person, right? And so the birthright was traded for a spool of soup and some bread and some water. Now, when you go on with this story, the story, of course, doesn't end there because, you know, the parents don't necessarily know about this story. But the story, the family dynamics gets really interesting because the scripture says that, that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. In other words, what they want, the scripture wants you to understand in this situation, not only did it really divide the twins and the twins were warring at each other, even the parents played the favorites card, right? And one, they were playing favorites and doing all these different things and all this stuff was going on. In fact, it got to the point one day when it was finally time for Isaac to pass. And Isaac, the father, is basically sitting on his deathbed. He can't see very much at all anymore. He can't really, you know, a lot of his, his ability to, to to feel and think and all these things are very hindered at this point. And it's this point where Rebecca comes to the son, uh, Jacob, and says, hey, Jacob, we're going to get you the blessing from your father. And understand this, this is one of like the holy moments of, of Judaism, if you will, is that in that dying place when a, when a blessing was set upon you, it was irrevocable. It was something that when this was given and taken from the father, if you will, to the family and passing down, it was something that could not be changed. And it was something that was a, a truly like a sacred moment for them. And so the whole system is set up where Jacob, uh, Isaac that is, has sent Esau out to hunt. He says, I want, you know, go out, basically hunt down some of that game, make this meal that I love that you make. It's so tasty and yummy. I want to eat it one last time. And when you bring it back, I know my days are done. So I'm going to give you the blessing in this moment. And so that's what Esau does. He goes out, he's doing this thing, he's hunting down the wild game and doing all this. Meanwhile, Rebecca goes to Jacob and says, hey, your brother's out, the blessing's coming, let's trick your dad. And so they literally get him dressed up with like sheepskin, with the furriness, right, to make his arms feel furry. And they get him to go in and to do all these different things. And sure enough, he comes in and, and, the, and Rebecca makes the meal that he's supposed to make and he comes in and the, the, Isaac says, you know, who is it? And Jacob lies, deceives, and says, hey, it's me, Esau, I'm back. And then, of course, what happens is Isaac goes, well, that doesn't sound, that sounds like Jacob, not like Esau. Come here and let me feel you, right? Because one's hairy, one's not. It's pretty easy. Now, the guy must have been really hairy because, I mean, if you have sheepskin stuff on, I mean, like, this must have been, like, big bearded dude, right? You know what I'm saying? So, but anyways, he comes in. And he feels him, and sure enough, he's kind of confused, doesn't quite understand what's going on, but he gives Jacob the blessing of the birthright, the first son, the blessing of being the better nation, if you will, the better descended people, and all the blessings that come with it. And of course, Esau comes back in, brings the meal, and says, hey, father, I'm here. And of course, Isaac is like, dear son, I just gave away your blessing. And Esau in that moment realizes the mistakes that he made in selling his birthright all those years ago. And he realized at this point in his life what he traded it for. And it's one of those moments where he's like, no, right? And then he's like, I'm going to get you, brother, right? So <laughs> there's this whole story that goes on after that. And yet in this story, there's so much deception, so much things going on, so many people lying to each other, people that you would think family units should get along and upbuild each other, uplift each other, and really care for each other. And in this story, none of that's really going on. They're all deceiving each other, stealing what's rightfully the other person's, tricking each other, and in fact, doing all these different things left and right with each other. And it makes you go, man, I would not post that on Facebook, right? <laughs> and not only that, like, it's such a testimony to what Scripture is, because the Scripture, if it really wanted to paint the pretty picture, it would have made all this nice and cheeky and rosy. And it would have talked about just a different story, if you will, if it wanted to really share, you know, are these heroes acting like heroes, but instead it shares their lives of the people and who they were and the things even they did. And of course, part of the, the struggle with this is you, you might stop back and you go, wait a minute. God has a plan to rescue the world through Jesus Christ and the people he's bringing it through are these people, right? <laughs> like, I mean, was there not someone else in the world to go and choose, right, and to come through and be part of? And in fact, out of the two brothers, 
even though Esau was an idiot, at least he seemed like a mighty, you know, woodsman man, and, you know, like, you would think maybe God would choose him, but God doesn't. God chooses the deceiver, Jacob. And that's something that I, I don't feel like me, you wrestle with for just a little bit when you hear that, because you go, wait a minute. God chose the deceiver to be the lineage of Jesus Christ. Such a powerful moment. In fact, and if you feel bad about Jacob right now, just know that if you continue the story, the deceiver gets deceived. Jacob gets a taste of his own medicine as you continue that story. So if you haven't ever read it, you can jump in about Genesis chapter 25, and this is where the story keeps going, where Jacob has to flee for his life from his brother Esau and basically go and do all these things. But know that what goes around comes around. So Jacob doesn't get away scot clean. But the promise of God and the blessing that was promised to Abraham gets passed on through the lineage of the promise which goes through Jacob. Which reminds us of a very, very important thing because for all you can say about Jacob, for his deceiving, for his not loving his brother, for getting into all sorts of things he shouldn't, going and deceiving other people as well and doing all sorts of kind of scoundrelish things, there's one thing you can't take from Jacob and that is he wanted God's blessing more than anything else. And when it came down to it, that was the most prized possession that he had in his life. Meanwhile, Esau traded it for a bowl of lentil soup. He was really hungry, I get it. But he wasn't about to die like he said he was. And so he traded it. And so the scripture says that he despised his birthright. You know, when I look at this story, it occurs to me that for so many people in my pastoral walk and talking with people, there I come across so many people that say to me, but pastor, in counseling sessions that is, but pastor, if you only knew what I've done. If you only knew. God can't love me. God can't. It wouldn't be a good and just thing, right? God cannot love me. And I don't want to go out and do the worst thing in the world, but like I need, I, I'm trying to wrestle through this. And so many times I have to counsel them and say, no, no, no. God's grace is bigger. And in fact, when you look at these stories, for anyone who would cling to God's promises, who would cling and say, Lord, I put this above every single other thing in my life, and I have not been perfect. I have got dirty hands. In fact, I deserve much worse than what I have in my life. But for anyone who would put all their hope in the work of God, receive God's blessing. It's amazing to me that when you think about this story, no other story can really proclaim it than the story that happens at the cross on Calvary where Jesus is crucified. As the Gospel of Luke records it, there's two, the Bible translates often as thieves on the cross. They weren't thieves. Better translated something like pirates, cutthroats, killmongers, warmongers, someone who would just take everything, kill you, take it without a single thought about it. Truly horrible people, the worst of the worst, truly deserved death row type people. And it says that when Christ was crucified, they started mocking him. The, the people that were there were mocking him. In fact, one of the other thieves, that is, started mocking him in even the moment. And that other thief that was on one side of the cross being crucified with Jesus said, stop it. Do you not know that we deserve what we get? But this man has done nothing. And he turned to Jesus and he said the most bold thing that's in Scripture. He said, remember me in your kingdom. And if you read Scripture in the Gospels, Jesus almost never specifically tells an individual, hey, you're golden. Right? He tells stories, he promises things and all this stuff, but he very rarely tells in a very individual and says, you have received the kingdom. And he looks at this thief and he tells him, today you will be with me in paradise. In fact, at that very moment we learn the critical lesson that we learn throughout scripture that there is no too far for God's work to be in your life. And so if you're here today, and or if you're joining us online, if you sit there and you say, Pastor, if you knew, I don't have to know, because I know that God's grace can be bigger. 
And yeah, you got to change. You don't get to just stay in those ways and continue on your ways. But I tell you, if you put your hope in Jesus Christ, he can take it. He can transform you. And he can once again pour out blessings upon you and make that everlasting life real for you here and now. It's available to all of us, should we so choose. Let us pray. Lord, as we're here today, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for your scripture. And God, as we're here today, we know that all of us have sinned in many different ways. There may be some in here that would say, Lord, I've gone too far. God, remember this moment and make this a holy moment for each of us. That we would see that grace abounds more than our sin. That God, truly, you are great. And we are astounded by your mercy. God, breathe new life into each and every soul that's here, each and every soul that would hear this message in our worship service here today. That it's never too late to turn to you, to ask for forgiveness, and to cling to your promises. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. And may you bless any who would make that decision here today for the very first time. May they, Lord, walk in these days to come. Give them the strength to come and find other Christians to join in worship and join in fellowship with so that they don't have to walk this journey alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.